How are you? Good. So you're back to Hyderabad. And I, I, I haven't gone yet. I'll go. Oh, okay. 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 Yeah, okay. Good to see you. Yeah. 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 Sabhi we are live now on YouTube. Okay. Let me first uh, mute myself. Okay, I have muted myself in uh, YouTube. So, Gayatri, I would uh, rely on you uh, for YouTube uh, question answers, okay? Sure, sure. Yes, definitely. Yeah, I'll keep a track on it. Yes. Yeah, you can just WhatsApp me also. Or, uh, yeah, you ah. can read out also after the uh, seminar is over. Huh? Okay, sure. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, let's wait for uh, another uh, minute or so before uh, we start. So, uh, Amit, should we start? Uh, Sanjay, sure. you want to say hi? Yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah. Hello, Prasad Mitab. How are you today? Hi, hi. How are you, Sanjay? Yeah, I'm good as well. Yeah, good to have you here. I think this is your first talk in chemical sciences. I invited Yes, you. that's correct. Yeah. That's correct. Yeah. So, very nice to have you here. I look forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, maybe uh, we, we, we start now. So, yeah, I welcome you all and thanks for uh, joining us uh, for this special lecture by Professor Amitabh Chattopadhyay. So, uh, who is an eminent scientist in our uh, era, I would say. Uh, Professor Chattopadhyay is currently a SERB Distinguished uh, Fellow at the uh, Center for uh, Cell and Molecular Biology which is in Hyderabad. 
um apart from that he is also associated uh, with uh, many uh, indian and international research institutes uh, like uh, iit bombay uh, jnu tifr uh, isa kolkata jncsr then um, uh, swinburne in university in australia and he has had been associated with us as well uh so professor chatterjee's uh, research uh, mainly focuses on the organizations uh, structure and uh, dynamics of uh, uh, biological membranes in the healthy states or in disease states and he has been pioneering in uh, using uh, fluorescence uh, probes tools uh, for his studies uh professor chatterjee uh, being a well known uh, researcher uh, worldwide has received uh, many awards and laurels he has been uh, awarded with uh, the world academy of science prizes uh, uh, shanti sarup bhatnagar prize and and ranbax research uh, award and and many more so i'm not going to read or list all of them here is a very short time to you know have everything uh, in one uh, introduction and he 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 is also um, uh, serving and he has been serving as editors or editorial board members uh, for several uh, um, uh, well known research journals or presses for example cell press uh, then acs like biological um, biophysical journal then acs uh, chemical neurosciences faves later jpc and and so on journal of, and and many more um he has been uh, cited uh, over uh, more than 14000 and his age index is way way high it's actually above uh, 60 he is also a popular teacher and um, but what inspires me or what uh, actually drives me more is his uh, depth in uh, or his interest in history especially uh, history on indian and uh, world science so whenever i get a chance uh, to interact with him in a conference or a meeting i always grab him and try to learn more and more from him about this history of indian science uh, so i i really uh, look forward always you know amit to you know <laughs> have a chat with you on this and and um, as i said like me there are many young uh, colleagues of mine who has been uh, like inspired uh, and and as i said that he has been a pioneering in in the, in the interdisciplinary research like where he combines his knowledge in chemistry and biology and for researchers like me he is one of the inspire so yeah with that uh, amit i would now uh, uh, hand over to you so yeah okay should we start so yeah. thank you so thank you sanjay and subhasha ji for the introduction all of you can see my slide yes we can yes okay yeah so thank you for this uh, op opportunity to share our research uh, not only to isal mohalli people but also to chemical science people which as was stated earlier i didn't get the opportunity to do that before but i am being told there are also students from surrounding colleges so it's a nice opportunity to share with all of you what we do now this talk i'm going to give on you know a kind of molecules called gpcrs and cholesterol so i'll start a talk with gpcrs so g protein coupled receptors are very nice you know cellular nano machines we call them and they are very good membrane proteins that actually helps you smell uh, you know you know think sleep and and so on and so forth and that happens because there is a series of signaling that happens when a ligand and i'll tell you what the ligand could be uh, binds to this these transmembrane receptors uh, which has seven transmembrane helical segment and then there are some outcome of this of course and that outcome relates you to you know feel good feel hungry feel sleepy feel happy or not happy depending on how the signaling is going so because this huge role in signaling they are very good drug targets so today about 40% of today's drug targets are gpcrs so uh these are you know i told you th I mean, as of today 36% of drugs approved by us fda target gpcrs so that's interesting 
And this contribution of GPCS to the drug market has increased over the time. Although it started long time back, even before GPCS were formally discovered. And I'll tell you, GPCS were formally discovered around 1970s by Bob Levkovich, who got Nobel Prize for GPCS in chemistry around 2012. Okay, so, but there is more, 36% is good, but there could be more. So although GPCS represent close to 40% of current drug targets, if you look at number of GPCS in your body, and there are about close to 800 GPCS, only 15% of them are known drug targets. So actually 85% of GPCS in their body as of today's knowledge are not drug targets. So there's this exciting possibility the GPCS which are not yet recognized could be potential drug targets for diseases that are difficult to treat by currently available drugs. Also, all these research till about maybe five years back was about GPCS as drug targets that are resident in plasma membrane which is the outer membrane of the, of the cell. How about GPCRs that are inside the cell, in nucleus or in other, or, or in the membrane? As time progresses, in the last few years, we understood these GPCRs also are very functional, but their function could be different than the ones in plasma membrane. And therefore, they could be target, the same GPCR could be a drug target inside the cell better than on the plasma membrane. And that possibility is also very exciting. So if I give this talk five years from now, it is possible that 70 or 80% of drug targets uh, are GPCRs, and that's really exciting for you know, our health, also exciting for people, especially young people who work on this exciting area of membrane biology. Okay, so we work with serotonin receptors. Serotonin is the ligand. The serotonin, as you know, uh, is an analog of tryptophan. It's called 5-hydroxytryptamine, but serotonin also has a huge biological role. It acts as a neurotransmitter in, uh, in the brain and central nervous system. And it sort of, these serotonergic pathways have developed over a huge time in evolution, millions of years. Uh, and so you find this in nematodes, to fruit fly, to, to homo sapiens like us. Now, signaling involving serotonin modulates several cognitive and behavioral functions. And so when the signaling is not proper, you get into trouble like schizophrenia, depression, anxiety, OCD, migraine, and so on and so forth, or also sleep-related disorders. Actually, all the sleep clinics that you see, they actually treat serotonin imbalance in your body. So that is all good. But if you look at this molecule, it's analog of tryptophan. As many of you know, the other part of my lab, which doesn't do GPCR biology, works on membrane biophysics, and that's an old uh, you know, line of work that I've worked ever since my PhD and still continues. And there we work, you know, use tryptophan fluorescence of membrane proteins for some very unique, nice results to understand how membrane proteins are all organized in membranes and even to understand their function. With that kind of curiosity, we want to find out whether this is fluorescent. Uh, unfortunately, are, are good for us. At that point, no neurobiologist seemed to know whether serotonin is fluorescent. So when we are trying to set up our lab, we sort of looked into this and found out that this fluorescence is unique. It's not like tryptophan, which is very sensitive, it's insensitive, or what the fluorescence, by the fluorescence people are used to call non-solvent non atomic, but still can be very useful for studying receptor ligand interaction. And that time we published it in the Biophysical Journal. Uh, we were surprised that people didn't know about this till then. That tells you that if minds don't mix, you don't get good science. Now, like many neurotransmitters, serotonin also binds to a variety of receptors on the cell surface to uh, elicit the proper response. Now, how many serotonin receptors are there? Well, as of now, 17 receptors, out of which these three, 5-HT3, are ion channels, so they are not GPCR. They are ion channels, which is four transmembrane domain. The rest are seven transmembrane domain. And we are interested in serotonin 1A, uh, which is the, uh, the, the receptor choice in our lab for a long time. And in a while, I'll tell you why it is the receptor choice. So the only thing I'll tell you about this slide is, especially to my younger colleagues, is none of the G-protein couple 
serotonin receptors that I show in this slide has been purified from natural sources till today. And if you may be surprised, the biology is so enriched these days, we have all technologies, all the omics, all the genome sequences. The issue is here, the amount of protein or the receptor in this case, in that neuronal tissue is very small. So you have to you know, first get a good source, then solubilize it with a good detergent, retain the function, then do affinity column, uh, uh, okay? And we did that and we got some amount of RBST money, but that was so little that it's very difficult to work with that. So most people clone this in different cell types depending on what you want to do in life. But this is something I want to keep in uh, point out because in most talks you won't hear this. Okay, now what is so special about serotonin receptor that we stick to this? Well, it has interesting uh, uh, you know, aspects. One is evolutionary. It evolved from in a branch off from its parent receptor group at a time when vertebrates and in invertebrates also diverge. So looking from that point of view, it is sort of a you know evolution marker. More, more, more on the lab level, this ligand, whose structure I'm going to show now, A2HD DPAT was discovered by some French chemists, French medicine chemists, medicine chemists, long time back. And because we get this in radio ligand form and in cold form, you can easily bind, use this to you know, separate the 5 ht one a serotonin one receptor among a mess of all kinds of membrane protein receptor because it binds serotonin one receptor with nanomolar affinity. Now, nanomolar affinity, as you know, is very tight. So you could do ligand binding using you know, manifold assays. You can, you can filter out the rest using JP filters. And this has been an extremely useful assay for us and others who work on these kind of receptors. Uh, its ligands show anxiolytic and antidepressant effects, so they are good drug targets for anxiety and depression. It was first of all the serotonin receptors to be cloned and sequenced by, of course, Bob Levkovich and Brian Kobilka when he was a postdoc. Last but not the least, mutant mice that lacks this receptor was, you know, generated in several labs in the end of the last century. And uh, amazingly, not only this mice tells you a lot about serotonin one receptor biology, but it also tells you because neurobiology is very, you know, it's a parallel subject, there's a lot of cross signaling, things like cocaine addiction people understand better because of this mice. So whichever way you take it, this is a very good receptor to, to, to work with. So you're not surprised if I now tell you that this receptor serves as an important drug target, uh, not only for neuropsychiatric disorders, but also for some form of cancer. So it's a very important biologically, pharmacologically important receptors. Where do you find it? You find it in different parts of the brain, but mostly in the hippocampus, which is these two peanut shaped objects on two sides of the brain, which actually retains, you know, it sort of retains your memory. So if your hippocampus is damaged, you lose memory, even depending on the type of damage, it could be permanent loss, or temporary loss. So our initial work was with hippocampal serotonin one receptors that we purified as a form of membrane. But then, now let me tell you the, 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 pre, the, the, the background of our work. Lots of people work on GPCS in the world, lots. And even when we started 20, 25 years back, lots of people used to work. So how do you find a niche for yourself? And this I keep talking because fortunately I'm not so young now, but many young people come to me, they're very bright, there's no lot of techniques, but they were looking for a problem to work, a, a sort of an ownership problem. More so in India, because India is a you know, very complex country to do science, to say the least. So how do you do this? But well, this is what I did, and I can tell you what. GPCS were famous even in you know, 1990s. It was discovered in the 70s by Levkovich, but immediately after Corona started working on it, Corona switched to GPCS around 1974, 75. He initially worked with Dr. Robson, then he was trying to do some path-breaking work on membrane biology after his, you know, the chemical genetic component of his work was done and, and, and he was given the Nobel Prize. He was a bright mind, so he made a lot of insight. But till end of 1990s, that is when I am setting up my lab in CCMB and want to do a big project. We are already doing some biophysics and all that publishing, but, you know, people always ask you, what's the problem you're working on, especially in bio biology? And if you say, I published a paper yesterday in this journal, they say, okay, yeah, that's fine, but what is the problem you're working on? So we're looking for a problem. But problems need huge approach, huge research. 
What do you do? And everybody in the world is, is working on this. So we found out that their major work on GPC till then was in two broad areas. One was cellular signaling. You know, biologists like to study signaling everywhere in the world. You get the signal in kids and you can study that kind of cycling, anything you want, CMP. And that was done by a lot of people in this community that those are biochemists, cell biologists. Other part belong that doctors are, are or MDs and they did pharmacological calculation, drug discovery. And they are mainly in pharmacology, pharmaceutical departments. But we argued because we, have, we come from membrane side that this protein is embedded in the membrane in a way that no, nobody can beat. There are seven transmembrane helices that intimately hug the membrane any way it can. I'll show you some way that you know, we found out. So isn't it you know, uh, uh, you know, natural that membrane lipase will, will, will modulate its function? And this was not rocket science because we already knew receptor, uh, ion channels like nicotine receptor, which has four transmembrane domain, is activity dependent on you know, the membrane you put it in. And I did my some postdoctoral work on that in UC Davis uh, after my PhD in solid group. And there are peptides like gramocidin and others, which people have worked on it. But GPCR people, since they come from pharmacology and biochemical background, they didn't think about this. Good for us. Uh, we looked very hard. We found occasionally one paper with one figure saying there's some different effect. But for some strange reason, which we didn't understand that time, the authors are very apologetic about the result. We thought this is an opportunity. So why it is an opportunity? Why did we think it's an opportunity? This is the reason. If you look at lipid protein interaction in cell in bio, bio, biology, for, for, for soluble proteins, we kind of know what factors you know, re, regulate their folding. Sequence temperature, pH, and strain process of reagents. Now, if you know this, you can even 30 years back, you could predict how the protein folds, at least in test tube in vitro. In cells, of course, there are chaperones and it's crowded. But over the last 20, 25 years, excellent work has come out from chaperones. So we know. The, at least the basic tenet of uh, solvent protein folding. We still don't know how fast each process is. And many groups, including some in Isar Molly and Isar Puni, are working on this. What about membrane proteins? Given the fact about one third of your body's proteins are membrane proteins, we should also know, know about them. And these membrane proteins are more functional than solvent proteins because half of the, in the cell's job is done by membrane proteins. Well, they are also amino acid. In the polymers, so sequence temperature, pH, and strain, and denature and absence of presence does affect, do affect, but these are necessary but not sufficient. What you need to know is nature of lipids in close contact with the, with the protein. Now, how do you know that? These are not covalent interactions, these are non covalent interactions. You cannot do Western blot, you cannot do uh, you know, some kind of um, assay where you look at cross linking. So, this is a tough thing to do. Either you have to do spectroscopy or you have to do very good quality microscopy, that very high resolution, which is not there at that time. Remember, state came much later, or, or, or diffraction of the microscopy. So we thought, now this, uh, the, the, the take home of this slide is membrane protein folding, and therefore function depends on close this with surrounding lipids. Now, which the two questions we start with, somebody asked, somebody told me long time back, if you ask a good question, you can do good biology. Don't worry about answer. Don't be afraid if you cannot answer everything. What is the question we ask? Which class of lipids interact with GPCRs for maintaining the function? Nothing was known at that time in the 90s. And then there's a basic biology question. What happens to human health if the biosynthesis of such lipids are defective? Now, the fact that biosynthesis of lipids are defective was known because there are very good people, some from India, like Professor P. S. Shastri from ISC. They worked on these lipid biosynthesis in a huge biochemical way, but there was no functional attribute to that. So it was kind of boring work only lipid people used to know. And you know how people look at boring biochemical work. So, okay, it's not so cool. But actually, it, is, it will be cool when you couple it to a functional GPCR, right? Because who doesn't care about the GPCR? You have to be happy, right? You don't have disease. So these are the two broad things that we wanted to do. And let me tell you where we are today. Now, so since it's a new project, we did not know whom to follow. Right? We cannot follow a Western group that has done this. So we have to look, 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 which is good and bad. Good because whatever we do is ours. Bad because we really have to scratch our heads 
And we did scratching it for a long time. And so we found out cholesterol is an interesting lipid, and I'll tell you why. Cholesterol's chemistry is not as simple as it looks there. It has three distinct, you know, sort of uh, components of the structure. One is the flexible alkyl chain. One is the polar hydroxyl group, which is the only polar part of this amphiphilic molecule. All lipids by definition are amphiphilic. And this is the structural, the, the ring part. Although it's only a double bond, it's very planar, almost planar. Now we all know it's like school, school chemistry, the aromatic molecules are planar, non-aromatic molecules are not planar. You know, cyclohexane is chair board and benzene is, is you know, is, is resonance planar. Yes, but this, and the planarity of this has to do a lot with its function. And the function could be that the lack of, if you keep one more double bond there, you could have a fatal disease and we work with such a disease called with the opaque syndrome. Okay, in 3D is more exciting. The bumpy phase of cholesterol, which is a methyl group, interacts with the bumpy membrane proteins, and the, in the straight phase of, of the smooth phase, as they call, interacts with saturated long tail fatty acids that are in the membrane lipids. Some of some people believe that this is also partly in, in responsible for raft formation, a slightly controversial domain name, but be, be that as it may, these, these interactions do occur. Okay. Now smooth and, and bumpy. Cholesterol is made in our body by a very complex set of biochemical reactions, about 21 in enzymes, very concerted reaction, discovered by a brilliant organic chemist, uh, Conrad, uh, Conrad Block, who worked in Harvard University Chemistry Department at the end of 1960s, or well, not in, to the beginning of the 1960s. And imagine how he found out all this just by radio labeling. So very tedious work. But Bloch was not only a good organic chemist, and it's good that I'm speaking in ISA. ISAs were built to you know, break the difference. Okay, he was also a good biologist. So there's something called Bloch hypothesis. He realized that as the, as the synthesis of cholesterol gets more, you know, organic chemistry wise challenging or biochemistry wise, the biology becomes more complex. So he said, Bloch's hypothesis unites this too. See how brilliant the mind is. It says cholesterol biosynthetic pathway parallels cholesterol evolution. So cholesterol is not there in E. coli, for example. No bacteria can make cholesterol. Microbacteria needs cholesterol for survival, but it doesn't make it. Yeast doesn't make cholesterol, yeast makes aldosterol. Drosophila doesn't make cholesterol. All insect cells are, you know, uh, cannot make cholesterol into the mosquito. Uh, they, are, they are oxytrophs. So they basically survive from cholesterol from the food. So we need cholesterol. We cannot survive without it. So our membranes have proteins that need a dynamic environment and cholesterol just puts the right fluidity or dynamics, I could say, in the membrane. So that's what Bloch understood in late 60s, early 70s. So cholesterol precursors, if you look, it's difficult to go back to uh, evolution. The joke in my lab is, you know, net fellowship is five years and evolution is millions of years. So if you tell somebody to study it, no student can study. Well, we are also chemists, so you, you can find out that there are precursors you can buy, 78C, you can buy ergosterol. So if you see their effect on membranes, you should be able to find out what was not right with these precursors with human proteins, for example. Okay, so Block got Nobel Prize for his effort, you know, in, 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 in 1980s. Okay, so on the top of it, our, our receptor is in hippocampus, which is part of the brain. Many of you don't know, your brain carries the maximum amount of cholesterol in your body. So 2% of the body mass is in brain and a quarter, 25% of free cholesterol is in your brain. So your brain is basically a lot of cholesterol and it is needed for making synapses, those junctions between neuronal, two new two neurons that actually determines signaling in your brain and your, your wellness or lack of it. Uh, cholesterol doesn't cause blood brain barrier. So brain cholesterol and body cholesterol synthesize differently. Although the enzymes are same, but they're specially and temporally separated because the kinetics of brain cholesterol synthesis is slower and there's a reason for that. So birth defects in cholesterol metabolism can affect, uh, you know, it can, can result in disorders like smith lindopi syndrome, something we study in the lab. We just had a paper accepting traffic where it showed what this disorder could be, but more and more about it later. And, you know, people take this drug called statins. Many of you have friends, relatives, or you know, people you know who take statins. Uh, and statins are blockbuster drugs, 
uh, in FD up to the 1990s. But there are people who get depressed also by, by chassis. So now we have data to show cortical cholesterol content is shown to be lower in mood disorders and symptoms of anxiety and major depression apparent in certain demons, very small portion, but no particular genotype upon long-term studying treatment. So a small molecule, a small lipid, is not a protein, can do so many different in, in the biological manifestations. So it's a very interesting thing to study. So brain cholesterol dynamics and roller cholesterol dynamics, all the studies you see domains and all that are all in CHO cells or liposomes or whatever. But brain is the part of your body that actually is to function. So we thought it's a good thing to study, you know, lipid protein interaction in the brain, brain tissue, or hippo, hippo, and cholesterol is a good candidate. So what did we do? So the first two we worked on this project seriously was Thomas. Now Thomas is a faculty in another ICR, sister ICR in Pune. Many of you know Thomas. And Thomas started these experiments, and we thought we had these hippocampal membranes that has not purified receptor, but purified in the membrane, and they're active because we can do ligand binding assay the way I told you. So Thomas did a deplete cholesterol using this. Uh, uh, you know, carbohydrate polymer called methyl beta cyclohextrin. Uh, cyclo it's a heptamer, as many of you know this. So it just sucks up cholesterol, and the, and the stoichiometry is two to one. Stoichiometry was determined by a famous organic chemist, Breslow, Ron Breslow. Uh, many of you know his name. He was he was a very famous faculty in, uh, in in Columbia. So you can deplete cholesterol as much as you want, as much as possible. I shouldn't say. That. And then you can, if you want to change cholesterol levels, you can also make that uh, in a complex in vitro in the test tube or, or a pinned up and see how much cholesterol you can add in depending on, it will de depend on what membrane you are choosing. And you can measure cholesterol by your cholesterol oxidase assay, which is nice now is you use fluorescence and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, you can do it on a, on a more high throughput scale also. All right, so Thomas did that. And Thomas showed that you can, you know, deplete about, you know, 50% cholesterol. That's not, uh, you know, or 80, 70, 80% cholesterol. But the interesting Thomas showed at first time, actually, is the ligand binding activity, affinity, ligand binding of the OH pair, which is the ag agonist, comes down to about 50% if you take this much cholesterol. So this was one of the first demonstration, comprehensive demonstration, no, no, no apologies, globally to show that at least our receptor, and we did not know how general is the prop, prop, property, and I'll tell you to the end of this talk how general it is today, serotonin one receptor needs cholesterol for its function. Although I must admit, we had no idea how, how. that's much more difficult, right? Easy to get observation. How do we know the mechanism? But Thomas also showed, since these are GPCRs, the G protein coupling is also affected. The blue carb is the control, red carb is the depleted. GTP gamma is the non hydrothermal analog. Of, 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 of GTP, so it kind of dissociates the, the receptor system of the GTP couple system. The scale, by the way, the log scale. So you see ICUT changes. Okay, now we know ligand binding decreases, G protein coupling decreases if you deplete cholesterol by MBCG treatment of hippocampal membranes. Very nice result. But this could be an artifact, right? The cholesterol does many things to membranes. How, how do you know? Well, one thing we can do, we can put back cholesterol. And Thomas did that. Now, this is tricky. Putting back cholesterol is easy in cells, but not in hippocampal membranes, but they're very lipid rich. It took us months and months to standardize this simple protocol, what we now think is simple protocol. And that's a lesson you learn in, 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 in research that you know you can get things results quickly, but to validate it, it takes time. But Thomas could put back 70% cholesterol, and we got 70% activity back. I'll show you data, data a few slides that we can actually put back more in CHO cells and we can get 95% activity back. So yes, it's reversible. So the question is now we have to answer, what is the mechanism or working model? Now, whenever you talk of cholesterol, 99% people can, oh, you know, it changes fluidity. And there's a reason for saying this. Cholesterol does change fluidity as has been done for you know, three or four decades of biophysical work using NMR, Lots of fluorescence probe, and we are also part a party to that. But we quickly realized it is not because of that. But although the cholesterol depletion does change fluidity, equal amount of fluidity changed by other agents did not accept, did not change activity to that extent. Then what is our mechanism? Our mechanism then a completely uh, proposed mechanism, no proof at that point, 
was cholesterol binds to some of these helices, and when you don't have cholesterol, there's nothing to bind, so the conformation changes, subtly, not a global conformation change, and that gives rise to different activity rhythms. Very nice model, no proof, protein is not purified. How will the world believe you? The world didn't believe us. All right, so when the world doesn't believe you, you go ahead and go, to the, go back to the bench and tell your students, guys, we have to prove this. Set up experiments that at least support, if not prove our hypothesis. So there are a series of students who did that, starting from Thomas. We want to not deplete cholesterol, but want to show that if you don't get cholesterol to interact with the receptor, the receptor is not functional. How do you do this? Well, multiple ways. You can oxidize the cholesterol with hydro cholesterol oxidizer enzyme that converts hydroxyl group to keto group and cholesterol loses its uniqueness. And we found out the ligand binding goes down under that condition. That's a chemical way of doing it. This physical way of doing it also. You can use nystatin, which is an antifungal antibiotic, or, or detergents like digitalin or saponin. They sequester cholesterol, they compress cholesterol, and sometimes makes holes in the membrane. And we showed that the, the ligand binding goes down in this case also. Finally, we also could you know, reduce cholesterol by just inhibiting the biosynthesis pathway that I showed, discovered by content block and other pathway by, by Candice and Russell. And it, it, it appears that whichever you know, path you do, either you inhibit it at the early stage, which is called proximal inhibitor statin, or last stage with an enzyme called uh, with a with an enzyme called 70 HCR, with the inhibitor called AY944, doesn't matter. At least for this kind of activity, I say, wherever you deplete, if you deplete cholesterol, if you reduce cholesterol, activity goes down. So taking it together, and this was done by Thomas, then following Sri Yamuna, and then Sandeep was in the lab, a, a very important group member. So our take home from all these diversely set up experiments points to one direction, that membrane cholesterol is necessary for receptor function, irrespective of the way you set up the experiment, irrespective of the way you deprive the receptor of interacting with the cholesterol. That's up to you. Receptor's function is up to the receptor. So far, so good. Can we do this experiment for physiological? I work in a biology institute and I've answered this question, and I believe in this. Because MBCD is not in your body, it's an endogenous compound divided from sigma. So how, how, how do you know this is real? Well, you, this may not be real, but you will have somebody in your family who takes statins. So let's work with statins. As I said, statin lowers cholesterol chronically, not acute. That means the cell has a time to uh, equal, uh, no, in a so called respond to it. So statins were discovered, as I told you, in 1990s, early 1990s. Not discovered, discovered before that by Japanese scientist called Endo, but it was uh, mandated by FDA in 1990. Okay, Sandeep did these experiments. So statin reduced cholesterol by 30%, but whether you use agonist or antagonist, the blue or the red, actually the, the function goes by 50% down. The fun thing, the interesting thing that we really like is the reduction in activity by statin and MBC was same, 50%. So the reduction in cholesterol was 30% there. And if you remember, the last case was 70% or 80%. So it's not how much cholesterol you take out from membrane that matters. What matters is how you are doing it. Are you doing it slow enough? In a very faint way, this is like the, the concept of equilibrium uh, or reversible work in thermodynamics for those of you who care about thermodynamics. Now, this paper was published in biochemistry because we say stress back. We actually hinted in this paper that why statin could cause depression, because there's no mechanical molecular expansion till then. Now I will switch gear now. We have come a long way till those days. I was showing you results from you know 2005, 10, 12. The downstream of cholesterol, uh, you know, GPCI activity is endocytosis, and is there's a bitter acid pathway and things like that. So this is the ultimate. How do GPCs go into the, in, into, into the cell? And why it is ultimate? Because a lot of people suffer from depression. We are in pandemic time, you know, depression, number of people. A lot of depression happens because of that. In fact, the antidepressant that one takes, the most common one, actually works the endocytosis of our receptor, certain one receptor. Okay, so GPC endocytosis is not a very highly studied subject, 
In those cytoses, you may have seen, even in India, there are groups in NCBS, other places. But GPC endocytosis is difficult because the assays are difficult. So endocytosis decouples the plasma membrane receptor with the inside, and it's a way to stringently control the signaling. Because if a, if a plasma membrane receptor is too much, it signals too much, and that's not good for the cell. Cell has a homeostasis, right? Now, so there's very few literature, not that much literature, you say, you know, uh, you know, given the popularity of GPCRs, endocytic literature is little, you know, scanty. And that's one reason is because of less assay. Coming back to serotonin, one receptor is more interesting. This has a major mechanism of desensitization and depression kind of things. But interestingly, people have shown that serotonin one receptor endocytosis depends on the source. In the in dorsal raphe nu nuclei, they do not show, you know, uh, they, they, they do show endocytosis, but in hippocampal neurons, they don't show. Why should the sequence of the protein is the same? One protein will go in, one protein will not go in. But the protein is same. So far as I mean, as sequence is concerned. This is, this is very, very, you know, interesting thought. But the papers that reported this didn't give any explanation. They just did the experiments in different cell lines and showed, well, it happens there, doesn't happen there. All right. But to do anything, to do, you need to develop assays for this. My student Aditya developed the assays very skillfully, but he took about two, three years to develop the assays and correctly do this because this was also not our cup of tea when he started. So this assay is simple. You have a MIGTAG CO2 receptor shown in orange. We basically have to look at you know, reduction in, 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 in plasma membrane population of CO2 receptor, which is there. And we do this by facts. This is the population-based assay, statistical assay. We also do this by confocal to see at the cellular level validation of the results. Once you know, it's very easy. So you, in fact, you get a normalized mode count. The difference in mode count, the shift, is actually tells you. It tells you from here to here that, I'm sorry. It, it tells you that, yes, plasma membrane population has changed because of the receptor because you have put serotonin, which is ligand. So it's ligand-induced endocytosis. All right, so we have an assay now, which is good news. And this is the shift. Remember, this is a tricky scale. So it may look small, but it's not small. Okay, uh, but what is the mechanism? It endocytosis, endocytosis can happen is textbook stuff when you have to teach cell biology, you know, clathrin intermediated. There's also caviar intermediated. And there are other non clathrin non caviar types. It's a complex subject, right? Even for uh, in other receptors. So we wanted to do this, we use the inhibitors. So there's a, 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 an in, in, inhibitor called pitch stop 2, which is inhibition only for clactin mediated pathway. And there's an inhibitor for genesis type, which is inhibitor for, you know, cavalry mediated pathway. So if we inhibit our recept, our process, we see which pathway gets less. So this is our result. Pitch stop 2, you, you can see, uh, just a minute. If you use pitch stop 2, endocytosis goes from here to here. That is, plasma membrane population is not decreasing. That means it's actually working on the, on, 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 on the pathway. Now, pitch stop 2, I told you, is an inhibitor of uh, clathrin mediated endocytosis. Classic clathrin mediated endocytosis uh, in the recent, uh, proteins like transferrin. Uh, Genistein pathway doesn't affect much. Now, in this biology, it's never all, all or nothing, but predominantly. And this is just confocal microscopy validation of that. We have the MIGTAC, the green, the transferrin. Transferrin is a gold standard for clathrin mediated receptor endocytosis. And caviolin is a gold standard. Chlorotoxin is a gold standard for caviolin mediated endocytosis. That's why we take them. We take suitable antibodies and we, how do you quantitate this? These pictures look nice, but they don't tell you any number. So you can convert them to a number called MANGAS. Polarization coefficient is a very nice statistically right number, and we, we, we can now analyze these results. You can clearly see the coefficient is high for uh, in transferring because it goes through, we know it goes through clathrin pathway, it's low for colloidal. Okay, so now we know serotonin one receptor internalizes via clathrin mediated endocytosis, but we don't know what happens after it goes inside. Which part does it go? Does it get recycled back? That's one part, or does it get you know completely chewed up in the lysosome? 
as you know, that is the classic two ways of endocytosis. So we use markers for that. Each of these pathways are markers. So the recycling pathway markers are RAP4 and RAP11, which are small GTP, small G proteins actually, and we, you can get you know, antibodies for them. So you can clearly see that we have some, any chase uh, the, the receptor. We have population of the receptor after 15 minutes and after, after 90 minutes. And if you track it with a lyso tracker, what is the lyso tracker? With the name suggests it, it, it tracks the lysosome. Lysosome is flat. That means it doesn't go to lysosome at all. And confocal also, also, also verifies that. So it undergoes endosomal recycling to the plasma membrane with clactin mediated endocytosis, endosomal recycling. So this is our model. We published it in biochemistry and got the cover page shown here. So under normal condition, CO2 one receptor gets clactin mediated endocytosis through recycling pathway. But having established this, and we, we got a lot of uh, nice comments for this paper because it was not known till then. We are interested in what happens with tinker with cholesterol. That's our motivation. So we, I did the experiment, we used statin initially. First thing, cholesterol depletion by statin does not reduce endocytosis. You, you can see endocytosis is still actually occurring. So statin treatment doesn't abolish endocytosis, good news. But what happens to the mechanism and the path? Again, we did the same, we stopped. And as you, you can see in this case, it's very interesting. With genistein, we saw endocytes is affected. Pitch stop didn't affect it that much. That means the pathway has changed. What we initially thought was going under control condition with the cavalier mediated, I'm sorry, clatin mediated is going through cavalier mediated. This is a big switch. Okay. There are no GPCRs today known except serotonin 1A, which has been shown to switch its endocytic pathway upon cholesterol depletion. Although there's one ion channel that's known to do this. And that's the liberating acid So this is a very exciting result. So this tells you that chronic cholesterol depletion induces a switch in the mechanism of serotonin receptor interaction or clatrin to with endocytosis. This was published in ACS Chemical Neuroscience. And, and so I'll show you. And what happens to the, it goes through caviolin, but does it get recycled or does it get chewed up in the in, in lysotracker? Similar experiments. Now you can see that. So I'm showing you the control here as a, as a dotted circle, but the, the, under statin treatment, we are showing the, the, the solid lines, okay? So what was at 15 minutes is gone, it comes down. You, the peak changes to somewhere around 30. So the complete route has changed. Previously, you are going from, you know, uh, Hyderabad to Delhi through Nagpur and, 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 and Gwal Gwalior route. Now you are going through Allahabad and maybe Hathras something like that. Okay, complete change. And last time we saw lysis tracker, there's no signal. Here lysis tracker has two huge signals. So our protein, serotonin on the receptor, under statin treatment, not only goes intercept through caviolin mediated portal, but gets chewed up in lysosome, doesn't come back to uh, our, 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 our plasma embryo. And we know this also uh, because we don't get that population. So this is our, our model for that. So this is the original, this is the control, okay. This, this is under cholesterol depletion. All right. Now I will end my talk in next 10 minutes, going back to the membrane cholesterol, how general it is that issue, and some recent development in GPC structure biology, including some contribution from ours. Now, I told you 2004 when Thomas's paper came out, it was the first paper glo globally showing cholesterol is necessary in a comprehensive way for GPC function, but we only worked with one GPC. In the last 20 years, we have done two more GPCRs, T2R4 beta test receptor and adrenaline receptors in collaboration with two groups, one from Delhi, one from, from Canada, we have shown this. But the world has been working and now there are about 60 GPCRs all over the world, Israel, Europe, US, okay, uh, where people have shown that, uh, just let me get this out. Need that back. Right, I need the pointer, just one second.
Just one second, I'll be there in a minute. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, so, so now we know the 60 GPCRs and work from different groups, uh, UK, but there are also GPCRs like secretin, cannabinoid CB2, neurotensin 1 receptors that do not exhibit crystal pigments. So why is it that some receptors signaling depends, actually depends on cholesterol, others don't. There is not one shoe fits all. That's a million dollar question now. Because why million dollar? We, we, because the physiology depends on that. Your drug depends on that. All right. So the recent advance in GPC structure is this. As you know, membrane proteins are difficult to purify, difficult to crystallize. First structure came membrane protein anti 85 as opposed to solid protein 1963. And there are very few structures till 2005 or so. GPCR first was 2001 by Chris Palchuski. But then 2007 onward, we are getting some structures and lately cry, cry again. Now, this is the sum total of all that, that I told you. You can see till 2007, we have only two, one or two structures. 2007, we got two more, one in nature, one in science. And then it has been a deluge, at least in GPC at time. I mean, we don't get structures like solvent proteins, but still hundreds of structures have come out. That's because there was a huge improvement in crystallization and lately cry here. I'll show you that. Uh, so 2007, what happened? Uh, Brian Komilka, who got Nobel Prize with Bob Lefkowitz in 2012, showed in this paper that not only you get a good structure, but that is except about you know, 1.5 for Elstrom, which is very good, crystallography. But you can see cholesterol between two GPCRs, between two adrenaline receptors. Now, we have been telling from Thomas's paper that closely bound cholesterol affects function, but we had no pretty picture to show. And these people have pretty picture to show, but they don't have functional data. So, and ours are much more physiological than theirs. But ours are in the membrane, theirs are in the lipidic cubic phase. With all due respect to their science paper, uh, that is not, if your body is full of lipidic cubic phase, you know, it will, signaling will not be done. But to their credit, that is the best they could do. This is the highest structural value that one could do at that point. So, we, and next year, you know, Ray Stevens, who collaborated with Brian Kubelke in this paper, showed. In the same adrenaline receptor, you could get cholesterol between two helices. And then Ray Stevens have been publishing series of papers, and these are just examples, not, real, not exhaustive, where he showed that A2 adenosine receptor, metabotrin, many GPCRs actually come with bound cholesterol molecules. It is now considered a hallmark of some GPCR structures. So where are we today? We recently did a analysis. It looks like 40% of unique GPCRs display bound cholesterol molecules from the structures we know today. And if we look at PDBs, because one GPC could have more than one PDB, 27% of GPC PDBs as of today display bound cholesterol molecules. So about 30 to 40% GPCs, as for today's knowledge, show or display bound cholesterol molecules. Now, how functional are they? But how important are they for function? That's where we come in. Now, if you see cryo AM, which is shown in green, has in increasingly come and is very dominant now in, in GPCR structure biology because it gives you a nice is, is Initially, the problem was is resolution not so good, but now you can do cryo AM with good resolution. And it has some advantage over crystallography. So, even many crystallographers should do cryo AM. But this is the, the picture as of a month or so back. Okay, now if you look at how many cholesterol molecules by GPCR, we did a, some kind of distribution analysis. It can start from one and it can be up to 10. 10 is our, our GPCR. The structural security one is came as, as, as latest as March of this year. And that paper showed 10 cholesterol in one of the structures. But there's also one with 16, but that's a dimer. So if you divide by two, it's eight. So still ours is the highest number of cholesterol bound. Now, where does this cholesterol bind? If cholesterol binds to specific regions of GPCRs and you believe that has something to be function, we must analyze those sites. So we found out there are sites called crack where cholesterol binds in soluble proteins and some membrane proteins. The crack has this tyrosine in the middle, some amino acids one to five, and then arginine and, and lysine and leucine are filling. So it could be as short as five stretch or as long as 13. 
Now, just because you have a crack doesn't mean it binds cholesterol, though. You have to do experiments. There could be false. Tony, Tony Watts from Oxford has shown neurotensin 1 GBCR has crack, but it doesn't show any cholesterol sensitivity. So this is tricky. How does crack, you know, bind cholesterol? So there are all kinds of uh, theoretical chemists and simulation people have been working on this. So people believe valinol leucine binds isoctyl chain. Remember I showed you cholesterol structure in the beginning? Tyrosine ring interacts with the four rings of cholesterol, stacking-like interaction, and lysine arginine interacts with OH group. Fair, fair, fair enough. Now, are there cracks in GPCRs? Well, no, nobody has reported for us. We reported way back in 2011 that yes, at least these three GPCRs that at that point was known to show cholesterol-dependent activity has cracks. Our GPCR has three cracks of two amino acids each, and they are topologically in transformation is two, five, and seven. Now we have done a lot of experiments with this, both simulation and experiment. And I'll end my talk by telling you a little bit about this and how we know how it affects at least sensitivity of cholesterol of protein on this. So we have been doing a lot of simulation on this and our close partner in this, very close collaborator is Durva Sanita from NCL Pune, all, all of you know Durva, I mean, many of you know Durva. We started collaborating when Durva was at Gronian, finishing our postdoc, and now it's been a 12 year in a collaboration. Now, at the time we started around 2011 or 12, it was very difficult to simulate the GPCR atomistically, but there's so many atoms, you know, water molecules, sodium ions. So we did coarse grain, and Durba was an expert in coarse grain. The Durba and her colleagues developed this Martini first film. And we did a lot of experiment with this. To cut a long story short, and I'm just quoting from our results. Uh, we showed that the, 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 the binding of cholesterol, we don't call it binding, we call it occupancy. Whenever it's a binding, people like biochemists and that, they think it's very tight, but it is not. It's microsecond time scale or occupancy, it could be nanosecond sometimes, dynamic, weak but crucial. So it's a statistical ensemble averaging of a very interesting kind that gives you function or lack of it. Sir, from other people. Yeah. Yeah, hello. Yes. Any, oh, any uh, Amit, you go ahead. I guess uh, some interruptions. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so it's a So it's microsecond time. How do we know it's microsecond time scale? Well, we did measure uh, the occupants. I'll show you. So, if you look at energy energy level kind of diagram, it's not a deep energy level diagram. These are, you know, this is it corresponds to a series of energy level landscape that we constructed corresponds to series of shallow minima integrated to a low energy medium. So today it is here, doesn't mean it will be here all the time. It, it can come out with a small change in pH, small change in temperature, small change in calcium. And that's bi biology as opposed to chemistry. Biology is done by very small perturbations. Okay, now we did found out this microsecond because Durba and we decided we look at maximum occupancy time, which is how much time a given cholesterol is on a given site during the time of simulation. Now, what is our time of simulation? Three microseconds. Three microseconds is pretty long for this time scale. And you can see we have peak, we, these gray regions are cracked. Transformation is five is important. But you can also see that there's some places where you have good, like here, there's no crack site, but occupancy is high. So it's not black and white, it's gray. You have to really do experiment to understand this. All right, so what experience to do? So I told you there are you know, three crack sites in our receptor. So we did a lot of you know, thought. We worked with people like, you know, who understand the, the, these things and we decided to mutate. And these are difficult mutations to do actually. We did some single mutation, some double mutation. We didn't do anything on transparent helix seven because the function of the GPC gets affected downstream. So we, we, we left it. And these are tyrosine to CD. And, and, and lysine, so this kept some single, some double. And we constructed them, you know, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 up, uh, upscale the DNA and 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 and, 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 and effect, I mean, infect the cells. Long story. What are we going to look at? We're going to look, look at signaling, right? Now remember this protein is a GI or inhibitory G, G protein signal. So if we stimulate it by 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 serotonin, it reduces cyclic equilibrium. That's what we measure. So let, so let me show you again. And serotonin binds. 
okay this gets sodium one receptor negatively couples to adrenaline cyclase shown here this protein and in in which cycling and synthesis so our assay is reduction in cycling and p why do we measure this as not something downstream because downstream you, you don't know what why is it happening the closest to membrane you are that more tightly tightly coupled between you so these are done by aditya parijat benji shown here and i'll finish in 5 minutes is is dr shambhu saji yeah okay so wild type so the first thing crack mutant receptors retain their downstream signal everything just because they are mutant it doesn't mean they are not signal they are signal good news we have got signal now you have to look where there is no signal it, so wild type will not, will not show this because wild type is cholesterol sensitive right all the mutants except two show it is like wild type so whether you mutate or not it doesn't make any difference although they crack mutations only two mutations showed the signal is going on irrespective of cholesterol content and both of them has k101 k101 lysine 101 it has probably helix 2 so this is what we came to know that once you touch k101 cholesterol sensitivity in zero to one is lost okay and uh, so this is what is, is summarized here lysine 101 it has probably helix 2 confers cholesterol sensitivity to zero to one function now we also did some And let me tell you, around March when we are writing this paper, this structure came out in Nature. Serotonin receptor was on the last DPCR of this family to have crystal structure. It is a very floppy. It has a huge uh, intercellular loop three, and you know, crystallographer structure biologists don't like floppy things. You don't like to take photograph of some a person who moves too much because it's fuzzy, right? And one and this published this paper in March in Nature and showed that. They, they reported three structures. In one of them, there are ten cholesterol molecules bound. There's an apo receptor without the ligand. Okay, now, and and so so this is the highest, as I so showed before in the graph. Among all the GPCR structures, this seems to be the highest cholesterol per monomer of GPCR. Now, what we did, we did simulation, and this time at atomistic collaboration with Yana Salen, who is from Barcelona, and Yana showed. That Yana and the, and the colleague showed cholesterol tightly binds between transferrin one and transferrin two by establishing polar contact with K one zero one. So K one zero one is involved in binding of this cholesterol A and B. Since the structure came out just when we are doing this analysis, simulation shows a tightly bound cholesterol molecule in a position almost identical to the one observed in cryo. I told you cryo shows ten cholesterol. One of them is this green one as shown here. our simulated one is the is the cyan one you see how close they are remember we don't have the full receptor but so this tells you the power of this kind of modeling so we are very happy about that and this paper not only was published in science advance but it is also recently accredited in faculty opinions so uh, th this is nice uh, uh, we i i a few other things to say which i'll tell you to your question answer i'm getting late This is my present group. A couple of people have left, but you know it doesn't look good when you take a picture with mask. So we haven't been taking pictures. These are some of our students. Thomas is here, but the others, Yamuna and others. We have a bunch of beaut, very nice collaborators. All of which I didn't tell you. Durbai is here. This is Sadhu Karni from Cleveland Clinic. This is Panikar from NCBS. This is Lawrence Salome, with whom we do single particle tracking in the end of age run. And our paper came out last year in BJ. And we do FRAP and FCS in CCMB. We get money from different sources. This is CCMB. We don't have Sukhna Lake, but we have Usal Sagar Lake, which is much smaller than than Sukhna Lake. We have two students from Chandigarh in my lab, and I and and I you know, tease them by saying Usal Sagar is better than Sukhna. And these are Chandigarh people. They 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 take they very seriously take it, but then I say it's a joke. It has a bit of ad advertisement if Sukhna permits. And I will end my talk here, and I'll be happy to answer questions. Thanks for taking five minutes extra. Sorry for taking five minutes extra. Thank you, thank you, Amit. Uh, so yeah, um, now with your permission, we will have a question and answer session. Sure, sure. And, and I see uh, Samrat raising his hand. So uh, yeah, Samrat, we'll start with you. So Amit, it's uh, such a great pleasure to uh, listen to you uh, in these very hard times. 
And uh, this is so refreshing to uh, listen to your uh, beautiful talk. And, uh, and particularly, you know, the last part of the story, which uh, just got published uh, a month ago. So uh, I have one uh, question, more chemical uh, question rather. So uh, the cholesterol, the way it binds to the, to the uh, GPCR, if I have understood correctly, uh, there is some participation of the hydrogen bonding effect between the cholesterol hydroxyl group and lysine NH3 uh, group, right? right. So uh, that is also kind of uh, somewhat quasi uh, visible uh, in crystal structures or other structures. Right, right. right. And for tyrosine, what kind of interactions uh, would one expect? Is it somewhat hydrophobic or OH? Uh, uh, hydroxyl and cholesterol hydroxyl hydrogen bonding? So people are hinted both. So there are people like Jack S. Feltini who has done some calculation on this also. So it looks like there's hydrogen bonding, but there's also some electrostatic interaction, not Coulombic straightforward, but electrostatic that are, you know, different than Coulombic. So R, R, R N is different, right? Okay. And so, uh, there are some some evidence of that. I must caution that these are calculations and not right. real experiments. But you know, you have to get information for everything to uh, to synthesize in our field. So yes, so that's what it is. But again, let me caution: if you see it in one GPC, it doesn't mean you see it in another GPC. As I, as I said, Tony Watts has a beautiful paper two years back in BBA Biomembranes, where yeah. the title says neurotens in one has cracked but doesn't show cholesterol sensitivity, okay. right? And since the negative result, of course, but, and secret in one, also similar. So you really have to go case by case, re yeah. re reviewers and some colleagues have a tendency to bunch it together sometimes. It is not like that. This phenomenon is as diverse as GPCFs. So you have to be careful. So another related question, if I'm allowed to ask uh, Sabasachi, so another related question is, uh, you know, I was quite intrigued by this, uh, you know, a microsecond to, I think you said it could also be uh, shorter than a microsecond uh, time scale of, uh, of, of binding and unbinding. So this is sort of like on and off rates you're talking right. about. Right. So now the, this is very intriguing that how, uh, you know, uh, so, so there are multiple cholesterols competing with the site and do you think that another cholesterol competing this competition gives rise to this uh, sort of sort of uh, very fast time scales because another cholesterol wants to occupy that so there is some cooperativity right. and then the other cholesterol goes out somewhat like nucleophilic displacement uh, reaction you're right Samra. there's cooperativity and competition both i wish i could show one of the videos that okay. Duma has produced uh, okay. So basically, you see a lot of police. So the nice thing about simulation is you can if you, you can look at any sure. snapshot if you want. You sure. have the data, right? So three microseconds is a long time in this kind of time scale. Right. You clearly see some cholesterol molecules which we have marked in our paper with the black doesn't move much from the receptor. About ten percent okay. of them, at least in three microseconds. So there others are come and go, come and go, come and go. Okay. And it is a priori different to say. So if you do this run again and again, because we do this, it is it is difficult to predict what will happen to the next run. Right. Yes, there's a bit of stochasticity included into this. And that's the problem in averaging this. We are still trying to find a nice, robust way to sample it, because we feel some of the, I mean, I'm talking of a shop talk here. Some papers have been published without much sampling, and they have led to some confusion. Okay. Because, you know, you can get any result you want if the sample don't write. Right. And as a physical chemist, one should know that. Now, these are huge sampling. You really need Anton kind of machine, which actually Brian Kovilka uses. We don't have access to Anton, but we have access to reasonably good computation, not Anton though. So we try our best and we try to do honest science. So yes, you're right. But the problem is, and, my, and you said microsecond, we have seen nanosecond hopping, but it's a rare event. Now, yeah. how do we say we have seen? We have seen in a, in a certain snapshot. 
can we guarantee what is the probability of the snapshot if I do it 100 times? The answer is no. We don't. Okay. So that stochasticity tells you that there are other factors that are affected that you probably don't understand as well. Okay. Uh, remember, it's not a linear system. That's right. Okay. And so it's, it's, it's a bit tough. But I think that's how life works. Right. Thanks, Amit. And thanks, thanks again for this uh, lovely talk. Thank you. Good to see you. Yeah, same here. Okay. Uh, any other questions uh, from the audience? From the Zoom audience first? Um, I have few, but I will uh, first go to uh, YouTube audience. Uh, so, Gayatri, do you see any chat uh, in the YouTube? Okay, no. So, um, uh, Amit, uh, then I will, uh, by the time others uh, get your questions, I will just uh, have mine one uh, cleared. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, as Samrat said, it's uh, <laughs> spellbound uh, like speech. I, I, I was very, very intrigued uh, with your uh, recent findings as well. So, um, uh, coming like uh, from the fresh one first, uh, related to your um, Langevin simulations and all atom simulations. Right. So, um, do you see the similar feature in the all atom as well? Like uh, what I understood is the all atom you have only the crack portion and the cholesterol and then docked and then did, done the simulation. Is that is it correct? No, that's not totally correct. We have done crack both in coarse grain with Durba and with all atom with, with Yana. That is most recent. Hmm. The reason we did not do uh, all atom with Durba was it was done a few years back when our competition power is not so high. Okay. Also, Yana has done a limited portion of crack where we have experimental data to show, you know, our CLP data was you know, a little older than the simulation data. So she had pointed from us. But Durba's, uh, you know, Martini coarse grain simulation where the microsecond time scale comes from there. So we have done both. Okay. Now, at atomistic is very, as you know very well, many of these simulations, a lot depends on the force field that you take. Now, one problem with Martini is it doesn't tell you much about electrostatics. Okay, that is, I mean, there are other coarse grain uh, force fields where you can get electrostatics, but the most popular one is Mar Martini, at least in bio biology. On the other hand, atomistic also, you know, there are, you know better than I do, uh, in nuances of the force field. So that's one issue one need to be careful about simulation. Second thing is how long have you sampled and how many people these days don't show how many times they are simulated, at least from the big labs. And you know that's a problem sometimes. Okay, because we do see, if you look at first three runs and have a conclusion, you do 30 runs, the conclusion may be completely irrelevant, statistically. So these issues still bother uh, people. Also, how do you say, set up the you know, system and things like that? But to, to, to cut a long story short, we have done both atomistic and we also did at, atomistic calculation with Proval Maiti of ISC, Bangalore uh, Physics. We have a paper long, a few years back. So we have been doing whatever we can do. And we have Durba as the main collaborator, but we also are free to collaborate with anybody who can give some information. But so it's going on at both levels. And right now, Durba and I are doing some calculations or in mixed coarse grain and at atomistic in selected regions. And that's nice. That's actually multi-scale simulation. And that's really nice. But we uh, just published one paper in uh, PLOS Competition Biology, not on serotonin, but on chemokines, which you may like to see. We, we, we do some nice work there on showing how dynamics can, uh, can regulate binding. Not sequence, but just the dynamics. And so we are also, understanding more and more about this as we do more. And as you can imagine, these are cutting edge techniques and cutting edge problems you have to visit. We tiptoe a little bit because of that reason. So the the 10 binding, like 10 cholesterols binding to GPCS right. and uh, with your uh, simulations, um, like uh, I, I can now understand that, uh, you know, uh, the, the simulation also, if you can do at varying concentrations of uh, cholesterol, yeah. you- It will be different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the 10 cholesterol is cryo -EM results. Right, right. And it's a static picture. So it may not... Um, well, 
Well, Rajoyan people do not like to be called static sometimes. They do tilt the circle sometimes. Okay, but it's basically static. Okay, also the sample conditions are pretty harsh. They don't tell you that, but it's cooled in very, uh, very kind. I mean, if you are a sample in Prairie, you won't like it. Okay, but uh, I mean, having said that, Prairie is very good for big molecules and complexes. So it's the best we, we, we got. So all this has its own, you're absolutely correct the way you are going in question. Yeah, that there are individual approximations of all these methods and they don't add up. So when you eventually want to combine it, you get a picture, it's better to take the lowest common denominator, then mixing it all, all up and giving a glorified picture, which could be wrong. Uh, so we have to be a little careful about that. Because cryo-EM also has its own problem. Yeah. Less than crystallography, but still. Yeah. Also the resolution is three angstrom, 3.5. It's not as good as crystallography. So uh, Amit, uh, coming uh, like going back to your previous part of the work uh, where uh, you mentioned about uh, um, endocytosis and the recycle, like uh, I did not understand why is it required for uh, you know if it is endocytes and then again without going oh. to lysosome. Okay, 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 okay. So okay, so first question first, endocytosis is required because any so till ten or five years where people thought GPCS signal only from plasma and that's still the major signaling. The canonical signaling. Ligand comes, binds to the GPCR either inside the membrane or outside. Class A GPCR is inside the membrane, class B outside. And then signaling happens through the G, G protein. Now, let us assume in one case you have got 100 GPCRs on the plasma membrane, right? And the cell for signaling, it needs some metabolite, right? Some second messengers, metabolite. It's like uh, some kind of synchronicity. If you have too many of these receptors on the plasma membrane, your signaling will be too much. So you will, then this process called desensitization that happens, it's a natural process that like to take the receptors inside the cell, but they cannot signal. So endocytosis is that process. It's a bit like you touch a leaf too many times, the leaf contracts, right? That's also called desensitization in, in, in biology, by the way, or tachophilis. So, so this is the molecular mechanism of that. Okay, so endocytosis, is a way to keep the signaling of the GPCR in a small, stringent, spatiotemporal scale. If it signals, epilepsy is a disease that happens because some channels in your brain signal too much. Normal people have less signaling channel than epileptic people. The drugs they gave, which has a sodium component, actually slows down the channel activity-wise. So too much signaling is not good for you, just like too much, too less signaling is not good for you. So, Endocytosis helps you to maintain this balance by putting the receptor inside. And that can happen by, for example, you phosphorylate the receptor. You, you know protein phosphorylation. When you phosphorylate the electrostatic exchanges and receptors get desensitized. So there's a lot of, you know, the electrostatic exchange, of course, nobody will tell you in, in biology, but that's exactly what happens. Okay. And so, these are built-in mechanisms by which a complex system, complex circuit, you may say, can maintain its overall homeostasis of multi-component homeostasis. And it's very, even then we are studying in cells only one receptor. We are not studying all the receptors. You can do simulation, now people do system simulation, very complicated. Shankar Subramanian does this, for example. I mean, where you get information about other receptors also, but surely that's not what we do. And again, there are limitations of the simulations, but that's in a, in a, in a nutshell, that's what is happening. So it's more like uh, <coughs> reform, like formatting uh, the membrane, uh, signaling from the that's right. perspective. That's right, that's right. And that can change if you perturb it or stress it or change the pH <coughs> or there's some disease condition. Wow, it's very... Uh, so it's an ensemble of signaling pattern. Right, right. <coughs> Sorry. Yeah. Okay, so um, if there are, uh, is there any other questions from the audience uh, in Zoom or in YouTube? Uh, Gayatri, no questions uh, from YouTube, right? Okay. Okay, so Amit, one last thing. Uh, do you see any allosteria as the cholesterol bound state or uh, or, or uh, the dynamics where cholesterol, when cholesterol binds to uh, 
uh, right, uh, right, right, right. So good, good question. So membrane proteins are by nature the multi polyprotein mem polytopic membrane proteins, the, which has more than one transmission, are generally very elastic in nature. To start with, let me tell you a little bit. I have one minute time. I'll take. You know the first elastic protein known in biology is hemoglobin. Famous work of you know Monod, Jacques, and all that. The first protein, membrane protein known for that elastic was also by a, a colleague of Jacques and Monod. His name is Jean-Pierre Changé. He discovered in the 70s and 80s that nicotinic ester is a very elastic protein. Now, GPC is also elastic, and this elastic has different um, manifestations. But in today's world, people talk of elastic binding site and orthostatic binding site. Orthostatic binding site cholesterol binds in the position or occupies, which competes with the ligand. So classical canonical ligand binding point. We, but we do believe that orthostatic binding sites may be there, but elastic binding sites are positions where no ligand binds, but still you get change in activity. That's elastic. And elastic binding sites are very cute in GP cell biology now, because now even experimental people have started believing that there are elastic binding sites. We have been telling it for a long time. Our simulation show, shows that. But that does not mean they are an orthostatic binding site. So it's a combination of orthostatic and elastic that drives the activity of a protein at a given condition. So if you want to understand how the protein signals under different conditions, in principle, in principle, you should know all that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, on uh, behalf of uh, DCS, uh, ISA, and as well as uh, DBS, as the head is present here, DBS head, so I would uh, like to uh, thank you once again, uh, Amit, uh, for being with thank us. You. Uh, and sharing some of these interesting results with us. And um, yeah. Thanks, Sanjay. At the DBS slot, to sir, Amit, time. thanks for your time. I think and, uh, we will have Amit again in DBS. We have had him uh, speak <laughs> at the DBS, uh, I think, five times already. I have to look for a different talk. <laughs> and we, we would like to invite you again uh, at the DBS as soon as possible. But we are doing also, very nice stuff with terahertz. I can tell you that. Right, right. So, Samrat, uh, next time it is going to be joint uh, DBS and DCS. Yes, we should probably start a uh, chemical biology seminar. Yeah. Yeah. That would be agree. wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Definitely, yeah, thanks we'll so much. have you uh, physically here. Because yes, those interactions absolutely. are uh, even uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. equally interesting. Uh, interacting with you in person is equally uh, interesting. And we need uh, our students to interact with Amit because you know he has uh, definitely the most unique uh, way of motivating our students. So we will. That doesn't happen very good in online, huh? unfortunately. Yeah, it doesn't work that uh, well in online. I don't blame the students. Yes. It's not happening. You, you need your child with them or something. Right. All right. So next time. Yes. Sure. Sure. I mean, thank you. Thank you. Thank, for, you. Uh, thank, yeah, you, thank yes. you all for being with us. And Bye thanks, on. Gayatri. Nice to see you, Gayatri. After the morning. Gayatri, thank you. Okay. So. Uh, okay, bye bye. Thanks, Anjali. Yeah, bye. Bye. Thanks. Yeah, bye. Thanks a lot. Have, yeah, thank bye. you. Have a good day. Bye.